Good morning, everybody. Thank God we're in church. Hallelujah. It's good to be worshiping the Lord today. I'm glad to be coming to you. Today, I'm going to talk about the goodness of God. I want to talk about the goodness of God today. If you have your Bibles, open with me to the book of Psalms. And I'm going to read Psalm chapter 27, verses 11 through 13. So Psalm 27, verses 11 through 13. And it's just good to be worshiping the Lord. Praise God. Praise God for the folks in Edenton. Praise God if you're watching us online, share it, tell somebody that we're, we're getting into the Word here this morning, and it's going to be good. Praise the Lord. Psalm chapter 27, begin reading the verse 11, says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not deliver me to the will of my adversaries. For false witnesses have risen against me, and such as breathe out violence, I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible. The psalmist is, 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 is asking God to lead him in a path that will not be a destructive path, or will be a path that will not lead him into his enemy's hands. Lead me in a smooth path, Lord. Lead me in a way that's, 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 that's going to keep me safe. And then he says this, and I think it's so telling. He says, I would have lost heart. I would have given up. I would have bowed out. I would have quit life unless I had believed. Unless this theology was deep in me, that I would see the goodness of God in the land of the living. One of the reasons why I love this passage so much is it shows us the, the belief that David had in the Lord. It shows us his concept of God. Because here's the deal. How, how you view God impacts how you live your life. How you view God impacts how you live your life. If you view God as an angry judging uh, being that's always after you to smash you and to knock you off course, then you're going to have a warped sense of what it means to live the Christian life. But if you see God as a loving Heavenly Father, as a Father that is good and there's no bad or evil in Him, and that His goal is to bless your life, and His goal is to help you, I'm not saying you won't go through tribulation, you won't go through trial, there won't be uh, difficult people, you won't face things. I'm not saying that at all. Jesus said in this world we have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But I am telling you, get the right view, get the right God view, get the right God view, and it will impact your life immeasurably. Amen? So when you come into situations and difficult issues, you need to realize, okay, my God is good, and God is good all the time, and I'm going to believe that I'm going to see His goodness in this life right now. David said, I believed, unless I believed I'd see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living, I would have lost hope. So I did a study on that, that, that phrase, land of the living, because I thought, man, this must be profound. So I studied it in the Hebrew and you know what I figured out? It means the land where people are living. It's exactly what it means. It's the land of the living as opposed to the land of the dead. The land of the dead was Sheol or Hades or the graveyard. It was the place where no people are living. That's not what David's... David's not saying, I'm just going to endure and I'll see the goodness of God in the sweet by and by. He's saying, no, I believe that I'm going to see the goodness of God in the here and now during my lifetime. That's how much I believe in His goodness. Come on, can somebody shout amen? And He did see that in His lifetime. I want to read you one other passage in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38. As the apostles were ministering, I think this is a telling passage as well. Acts chapter 10 verse 38, the Bible says, How God anointed, this is Peter's sermon to Cornelius' household. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, who went about doing good. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. 
He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Here's a theological principle you need to have in your life. Memorize it. Get it in your spirit. God is good. God is good. God is holy. God is righteous. God is love. But also, God is good. And He is good all the time. He's immutable. He's unchangeable. He's not going to turn it on and turn it off. He's good all the time. Come on, can somebody shout hallelujah? A Puritan by the name of Thomas Manton, the great Puritan writer, he said this, God is originally good. God is originally good. He's good of Himself, which nothing else is. Everything else is good in relation to or in connection to God. He's good by Himself. For all creatures are good only by participation and communication from God. He is essentially good. Not only good, He is goodness itself. The creature is good as an added quality, but God is good in His essence. He is infinite. He is infinitely good. The creature's good is but a drop, but in God there is an infinite ocean of His goodness. He cannot be less good than He is, and there can be no addition made to Him, and no subtraction can be made. From him. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this when often others, when others behave badly to us, it should only stir us up to the more heart to more heartily give thanks unto the Lord because he's good. Even when people do bad to us, it should just stir us up to give praise to the Lord because he is good. And when we ourselves are conscious that we are far from being good, we should only the more reverently bless him that is good. Spurgeon said, we must never tolerate an instant's unbelief as to the goodness of God. Whatever else may be questioned, this is absolutely certain that Jehovah is good. His dispensations may vary, but His nature is always the same. Come on, shout it out with me. God come on, is good. Hallelujah. Put your hands together. Come on, God is good. Give Him a praise in here. Hallelujah. We believe God is good and He's good all the time. It's His nature. It's the theology we carry. Listen, this is essential because if you don't have this in your spirit, when you go through difficult times, you're going to be tempted to start blaming God for everything. Get it in your spirit and in your mind. God is good. Second thing is, if He's good, then that means everything He's created is good. If God is good, then everything He has created is good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 21. Then God God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the first day. He saw everything He had created, and indeed it was very good. So all of the earth realm that God has created is good. Creation is good. Man has messed some things up, but God gave us a beautiful creation to live in, and it's good. Then he says, the psalmist says in Psalm 139, 14, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. So even humanity that God created is fearfully and wonderfully made. We are good creations of God. I know in Christian history that often the, 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 the flesh has been um, uh, spoken down of or spoken negatively about because in Paul's writings he talks about the flesh and how it's a bad thing, but you have to understand what Paul is talking about is not this right here. He's talking about flesh as a sin principle, the principle of sin that works in fallen humanity. And to Paul that is bad, But that's different than what God has created. Everything that God has created is good. This is a basic principle and basic doctrine of Christianity. We believe everyone is created in the image of God. And we believe everyone that God has created, that He's created something good out of them. Though they are sinful and fallen, they're nonetheless good in created order. And so this provokes us as believers to love people of all shapes and sizes and backgrounds because we see them 
as being created in the image of God. Don't care what your racial background is, what your economic background is, what, your, what, your, uh, what country you came from. It doesn't matter. I'm, if I see Christian theology properly, I see you as a creation of God, and you are good in that sense, and you're created in the image of God. Oh, hallelujah. 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 Come on, somebody raise your hands and give him a praise. Not only is he good, but everything he's created is good. So, so look, notice Psalm 145, verse 15. The eyes of all look expectantly to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Psalm 33, 5. He loves righteousness and justice, and the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. The earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. I think we should have a positive attitude to God's creation and created order, that everything He has created is good, and we can enjoy it. You can enjoy this world without being locked in sin and in bondage to sin. You can enjoy it. I go to the mountains and I hike, and I absolutely love it. And I usually like to hike alone, because when I'm hiking alone, I just take time to think, and I'll stop at a certain vista or stop where I see a cliff or something, and I just sit there and soak it in. God, this is what you created. Some of y'all like the beach. God bless you. You can go to the beach. Look out. See God's creation. Hear the waves crashing in. It's a beautiful thing. Some of you guys love to hunt and fish. And part of that, I think, is just to get out in nature. I used to love riding motorcycles and dirt bikes just to get out in the woods and just to take in some of God's goodness, man. Oh, hallelujah. God is good. Everything is created is good. Humanity has been created as a good thing. So then what happened? What happened in all this? Well, there was a tragic fall of mankind in the garden. Adam and Eve fell and fell into sin and breached the relationship between mankind and God. But it didn't affect God's goodness. It didn't affect His goodness. Yes, judgment comes because no evil can exist in His presence, but yet God's desire for man is still to be good. I think about the book of Job. How in the book of Job, Job went through trial after trial after trial, and he didn't understand why he was going through all these trials. And then friends came along and gave their explanations as to why he's going through all these things, and it still didn't satisfy. And then in the end, God shows up, and God doesn't answer any of the questions or doubts that these guys had. But all God did was put Job's problems into perspective. If you think you've been through some stuff, let me show you how great I am. And God shows him all of his greatness. And then the Bible says, Job said, I've spoken of what I did not know. He said, I had heard of you from the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes have seen you, Lord. And then the Bible says he blessed Job with twice as much as he had before. So God's intention was to bless Job all along. Even through all of those trials he went through, the outcome was to be better, better, better. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. I went through major trials in my life over the past two years, and I kept walking saying, God, even though I don't feel it, I know you have good in store for me, and I know you're going to bless me. I would have people come up and give me prophetic words. God's going to restore everything the enemy has taken. God's going to bless you in the end. And I just received it. It was hard to see at the time, but I knew that God was going to bring good out of all of this. Come on, some of you have come, we've all come through COVID, but some of you, it hit worse than others. Maybe you lost loved ones. Maybe you lost jobs or finances. Maybe you, maybe you just uh, had an issue going through it, maybe depression and stuff. But I'm telling you, Get your eyes above the circumstances and realize that God does want to bless you in the end. His goal is to bring you to a place of blessedness. Come on, can somebody shout hallelujah? So what happens? What is our response? How do we even respond to a God who's this awesome? A God who wants to bless us. A God who's good all the time. When I wake up, in the morning, He's going to be good. When I wake up next week, He's going to be good. When I wake up next month, He's going to be good. He's, going, he's not going to be better. He can't get better. He's the best. He can't get better than best. Hallelujah. He's going to be good all the time. So what do I do? What's my response? My response, I think the highest response I can give is just to worship Him. 
I think the greatest response I can give is just to sing His praises. Just to, just to stand there and rejoice in His goodness. And my praise is a response to something so good that I couldn't accomplish it on my own. My praise is a response to the grace of God, which I didn't deserve. My praise is a response to the forgiveness of God, which I couldn't buy. My praise is a response to the blessings of the Lord that I didn't deserve. Oh, hallelujah. So now I praise Him just out of a response. It just comes to a point, a just crescendo, that I just say, God, I can't stand it anymore. I just got to thank You. I just have to praise You. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible says in Psalm 107, 8, Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for His goodness. Hallelujah. We're worshiping Him because of His goodness. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, he, his own special people, that you, and He brought you out of darkness into His marvelous light that you may proclaim the praises of Him. He brought us out that we might proclaim His praises. He showed us His goodness that we might proclaim His praises. He saved you that you might proclaim His praises. And now He's setting you on display as a trophy of His grace to the world and all of the demonic powers in the region to see this is what it looks like when the goodness of God touches a human life. Hallelujah. Somebody shout hallelujah in here this morning. This is what it looks like when the goodness of God touches a human life. I want to read you a couple passages here that are just so profound. Our response is praise. Our response is praise to the goodness of God. Go with me to the book of Psalms. And let's just look at Psalm 91. Why don't let's just, let's just begin there. I want to show you two different Psalms. Psalm chapter 91. And if you don't know this Psalm, you should know it. You should pray it over your lives. The Bible says, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the El Shaddai. <laughs> if you dwell under His shadow and you're living under Him, He's covering you with His goodness. And that El Shaddai, the Lord Almighty, it means He's the one who ever supplies. He's the one who has enough, enough ability to make happen what you can't make happen. Hallelujah. He's the one who's going to come up and make things start to move in your life. What response do we have but just to praise Him? Lord, I thank You that You're the El Shaddai. I'm going to tuck up under Your wings, Lord, and let You be God. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him will I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. He'll cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor the destruction that lays waste at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked." Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the Most High, your dwelling place. No evil shall befall you. No plague shall come nigh your dwelling. For He shall give His angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. In their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Hallelujah. Then He goes in and He concludes this. You shall tread upon the lion and the cobra, the young lion and the serpent. You shall trample underfoot. Because He has set His love upon me, therefore I will deliver Him. I will set Him on high because He has known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer Him. I will be with Him in trouble. I will deliver Him and honor Him. And with long life will I satisfy Him and show Him my salvation. That sounds like to me, that's a good God. That's a God who wants to bless, a God who wants to protect, a God who wants to heal, a God who wants to rebuke sickness and disease, a God who wants to satisfy with long life. Come on, get your eyes off the negative stuff, get your theology corrected, and see God as good. Somebody give Him praise. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
Turn with me to one more psalm, because this is so this is so good. I feel like shouting in here this morning. Psalm 103. Psalm 103, so powerful. The Bible says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Forget not all of his benefits. God has a benefit plan. When you serve him, there are certain benefits that come along with the plan. And here it is, he says, who forget forgives all your iniquities. He forgives all of your iniquities. It's not like, Hans, I'm going to forgive you of 95% of the things you've done, son, but there's 5% I just can't deal with. God doesn't say that. God doesn't say that to you. He says, I'm going to forgive all of your sin so that your slate is washed clean and you've been, you're as white as snow now. Hallelujah. I'm forgiven everything. Some, some of y'all are worried about certain things you did in your past that everybody reminds you of or it comes back up in your memory every now and then and you think, well, maybe that's not under the blood or maybe God can't forgive that or maybe God's not going to do that or maybe judgment's coming on my life because of that. Just, just, just realize right now, if He's forgiven it, He's forgotten it. If it's under the blood, it's gone and it's washed away. If you've been justified, it's just as if you've never sinned and God has wiped your slate clean in heaven. Hallelujah. And now just receive the goodness of God. He forgives all your iniquities. Somebody shout hallelujah. Then the next thing says, and he heals all your diseases. It's not like, well, you know, son, I can heal that common cold, but that headache's just way too much for me. I don't think God operates like that. I don't think he does. Or or I, I can heal this certain blood disorder, but I can't heal a cancer. No, God said he can heal it all. There was never a disease too difficult for Jesus to heal. There was never a demon too bad to the bone enough for Jesus not to cast out. And He's a God of all flesh. He's a God of all creation. God knows every amoeba, every bacteria. He knows every kind of disease, every cell disorder. God knows it all. He created the original form of man. And God can heal anything that He's created. Come on somebody, shout hallelujah. He forgives all of your iniquities and heals all your diseases. Praise the Lord. Then it says, who redeems your life from destruction. One of the benefits of the good God is He wants to buy back your life and redeem it from destruction. He wants to bring you out of that situation, that, 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 that thing that's going downhill. You say, my life's going down the tubes. God wants to call you out of it and bring you out of it. I love the story of when Jesus came walking to the disciples on the seas and they looked out from the boat and they saw Him walking and, he, and they started communicating with one another. And Peter said, Lord, if it's You, bid me come. And He said, it is I. And Peter steps out of the boat and he starts walking on the water. And the Bible says he did it. He walked on the water to Jesus. But then he started looking around and he realized the wind was blowing. The waves were licking. And he's got his mind on the circumstances. And he began to sink. But then the Bible says Jesus stretched forth his hand. Jesus stretched forth his hand and pulled him up out of the water. Hallelujah. That's what he wants to do. Redeem your life from destruction. Bring you out. Stretch out his hand and bring you out of the situations that are absolutely bringing destruction into your life. Come on, somebody shout amen. He forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases, redeems your life from destruction. Then it says He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies and satisfies you with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle's. God just wants to heap blessings on you and heap blessings on you so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. You know, the the, the life of an eagle is that when an eagle gets to a certain point, they will go through through a molting stage. They'll go expose themselves, maybe on a cliff or a rock somewhere, and they'll expose themselves and they'll, they'll, they'll lose their kind of their outer form, the feathers and the beak and all. And then if they make it through that, Their youth is renewed and it all comes back new. I think this is the image the psalmist had here for you and I. When we're serving the Lord, He renews our youth. 
Just like the eagles, He brings that blessing back. It means you don't have to get old and bitter. It means you don't have to get old and, and lose your fire. It means the older we get, the better we should get. The older we get, the more on fire we should get. The older we get, the sweeter we should get. The older we get, the more knowledge and wisdom we should have of the Lord. Come on, somebody, shout hallelujah. God is a good God. Shout it out. God is good all the time. Come on, one more time. God is good all the time. And so let me bring this down to a close here. If God is good, if everything He's created is good, if His, if His intentions for us are good, then the best life I can live, the good life, is to live the life that He's prescribed for me. That's the best life. Some people say, man, I'm living, a good, I'm living the good life. And they're really living a life of bondage and sin. But if you're really living the, the life that God has prescribed for you, that is the good life. Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15 Good understanding gains favor, but the way of the unfaithful is hard. The way of the transgressor is difficult, but the way of the person serving the Lord is the blessed way. Jesus said in Matthew 11, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus didn't say, come and follow me and I'm going to make your life miserable. I'm going to make you miserable, man, but you'll get heaven after a while. No, He didn't say that. He said, I'm going to give you blessings and I'm going to pour out my favor on you and my yoke is going to be light on you and even though you may walk through tribulation and hard times in this life, in me, you're going to have this access to the goodness of God. Hallelujah. In me, you're going to have this access. I've been all around the world. And I've noticed people in different cultures, of different economic status, in, in different educational uh, abilities and stuff. I've seen people in all different strata, and I notice if they're serving the Lord, usually I'll walk into their lives, and they're just happy people. They're just happy people. Glad to be serving the Lord. Happy that God is so good. Oh, hallelujah. I've been in Washington, D.C. with wealthy families and stuff, and I've seen them just have the joy of the Lord. I've been overseas where people are worshiping on dirt floors and with a light bulb hanging down from a cord, and they're just happy in the Lord. Come on, it's, it's about knowing God and having Him in, his, in your heart, and that is the good life. That is the good life. We're in a constant pursuit here in this world for more, especially the Western world. It's just a, it's just a race for more and more and more, and that's tiring and that's wearisome. It's wearisome if you're just trying to outdo the next guy. If you're just trying to keep up with the Joneses. That's a wearisome life where God offers you the blessed life. God offers you a good life. Come into the presence of the Lord. Come into the things of God. Let His wings hover over you and let that blessing of God rest upon you. I knew a couple several years ago who came to a meeting of mine and they had been separated. They were married, but had gone through problems and separated. They came to my meeting I preached, and they ended up repenting individually and getting their hearts right with Jesus, and then they got back together. This was probably 20 years ago. And now, I know this couple very well, and they got, to, they got back together, been living a wonderful Christian life, been working for the Lord for years. They have a son who's now a teenager, and it's just like, that's you, Jesus. That's what you do. You do that to people. You, 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 it's a blessed life they live. We have several individuals in our congregation who came out of drug and alcohol backgrounds. They thought they were living the good life, partying it up, but they realized it was really just bondage. Some of them almost died. Some of them almost OD'd just because they're just thinking, they're pursuing this life that's supposedly the good life. But then once they encountered Jesus and they gave their hearts to the Lord, they got free of those addictions and they experienced the true goodness of God and the good life. And I, we have one guy who was set free from alcohol and from drugs and he went back, once he got saved, he went back and witnessed to all of his former drug dealers. All of his former drug dealers. And some mornings he would bring some of these guys to church with him. I remember him coming up to me one morning. He said, Pastor, I just want to let you know I got, 
Joe here. Not his real name, but I got Joe here with me. He says he needs Jesus. And I just looked back there, and here was Joe like half high, drunk or something. I was like, thank you, God. Hallelujah. We're in the right place. And I just be preaching the gospel. And we saw some of these guys get saved. I remember the first time we had a wild game banquet at our church many years ago. Our men's ministry decided to invite all of their lost hunting and fishing buddies to our church for a dinner, and then we're going to have a guy speak to us who was a guide, had been a guide in Alaska, hunting and fishing guide, but he was a devout Christian. And so we got in there that night. I remember pulling up onto the church parking lot, and I remember looking out and seeing all of these pickup trucks with dog boxes on the back. I, I, it was the most amazing sight ever. I walked into our family life center, and there was stuffed bear and deer and, you know, everything. they had all these animals out. And then I walked into the fellowship hall, and there it will look like a Duck Dynasty convention. I mean, camo and beards and rough-looking people, man. I went and took a seat right in the middle of them, and we started eating together. The guy across from me starts dropping the F word. And I thought, yes, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. I'm in the right place tonight. I didn't get offended. I could have said, hey, man, I'm the pastor of the church. You stop that stuff here. But I didn't do that because I knew that guy was getting ready to experience the goodness of God. And then my man got up and he spoke and he talked about being a hunting guide and a fishing guide and he talked about the power of guiding and, and then he came to a point and he said, now men, you're the guides for your family. How are you doing with that? Are you leading your family in the right way? And then he gave a call of salvation and many of those men in that, many of those rough guys in that room that night responded to the gospel and gave their hearts to Jesus or at least some of them at least inquired about wanting to know more about serving the Lord. I'm telling you what, that's what it's about, folks. Hallelujah. It's about exposing people to the goodness of God. The roughest, the nicest, the wealthiest, the poorest, the whatever. Let it go. Let the goodness of God come out. You know, sometimes we just house up the goodness of God in our churches and won't let anybody in because it's all about us. It's us for and no more. Bless God, we're the chosen frozen and we're going to keep this message to ourselves. Let, let that go. I, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't come in that way. I came in through salvation. I got radically saved. God pulled me out of the world, set me apart, showed me His goodness, and I couldn't resist it. And now we got to let the world know. You know, Paul says this. He says, the goodness of God leads men to repentance. It's the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God. Because once you get a glimpse of how good He is, Nothing else satisfies. Nothing else satisfies. Once you've tasted His glory, nothing else satisfies. There's no award. There's no accolade of man. There's no movie. There's no game you can play. There's nothing. There's no relationship that can compare with tasting His glory. Once you've tasted His goodness, you're ruined for everything else. Once you've tasted his goodness. And I'm telling you, God wants to pour it out on you today. He wants to show you His goodness. He wants to expose you to His goodness and His power. I know I've preached hard and I've just preached at you today, but I wanted you to see from the Bible, God is good. His creation is good. He is, he, we respond to Him through praise. That's our response to His goodness. And now His goodness, He wants to bring that goodness and reach out to you and impact your life, change the way you think, change your heart, and give you power to go on into your future in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, can somebody just raise your hand and give Him praise right now? Come on, can you just raise your hand and give Him praise right where you are? Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to pray right now, but I love you guys. Let this message ring in your spirit all this week. In Jesus' name. Thank you so much for listening today, watching with us opening your heart to the Word of God. It's my highest honor to preach the Word. Our church exists to reach people like you. That's why we exist, to be able to communicate the gospel to the entire world. God has given us such an amazing outreach here to be able to do it this way through the Internet and stuff. It's just, it's just absolutely amazing. So I pray that God has touched you today, that God has ministered to you, and I want to pray for you right now. 
If you need to accept the Lord into your heart, give your life to Jesus, or if you need healing in your body or healing in your mind, I want to pray for you right now. Could you join with me? Come on, just make this declaration. Jesus, I believe you are my Lord and my Savior. I repent of all sin, and I commit my life to you right now in Jesus' name. Come on, if you need healing, stretch out your hand. Father, for those who need a healing touch, I pray, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that you heal them body and mind and touch them right now. We rebuke the disease and sickness that it's afflicting their body, and I pray for a complete wholeness. Come over them in the name of Jesus, and we give you thanks for it, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, give him praise right where you are. Thank God for everything he's done in your life. Tell somebody what the Lord has done for you. We love you guys, and it's a privilege to come to you.